Hello everybody, I'm David Bowen, Head of the Energy Team at Harper MacLeod, and on behalf of our team and the whole firm, I would like to welcome you all to this virtual Shrek. We are of course saddened by the terrible effects the COVID-19 virus has had on our country, and our hearts go out to any of you who have lost relatives or friends due to the virus. But we've always tried to innovate and improvise at Shrek, and we very much wanted to bring you this mini version of our conference, now in its 11th year, as a taster for what we intended to cover, and in the hope that we can amplify an update on this if we are able to go ahead with the real thing on the rescheduled date of 24th September. A number of our speakers have been able to download their talks or take part in Q&A sessions with Nikki Marr. So after me, you'll hear from Audrey McKeever from High, George Baxter from Green Power, Terry Stebbings of Proterra Energy and Ryan Felber of Resource Efficient Scotland and Jeremy Sainsbury of Natural Power. And we're very grateful to all of them. As an introduction to the session, however, I wanted to touch on three topics the progress Scotland's renewable energy industry has made over the last year and what we have to look forward to. Secondly, the attempts to, ta to tackle climate change. And third, the effects COVID-19 is having on our, on our industry and what can be done to mitigate these. For the last few years, we've talked about the goal of using renewable energy sources to provide 100% of our electricity consumption by 2020. And the good news is that we're in sight of this. Figures to the end of 2019 showing that 90% has been achieved. Also, another topic we've covered in the last couple of years, after a long battle, the UK government has now been persuaded to see sense and to allow onshore wind and large solar back into the next CFD auction so that the cheapest forms of electricity can compete for the money available under the CFD, and that will be a further boost to these industries. As a result of that, our team at Harper MacLeod has been involved in increasing numbers of onshore wind developments and acquisitions over the last year as the industry gears itself up for more activity. In some ways, it's surprising how much activity there has been over the last few months, but this is a resilient industry and one which looks towards the future and wants to get everything ready so that when we hopefully move back to normality, then everyone is ready to go. That activity in relation to onshore wind is, however, going to depend to a large extent on the planning reforms our industry hopes to see coming forward as part of National Planning Framework 4. That's due to be, de to be debated over 2020, and we'll hear more about that later in one of the other talks. There have been a lot of other developments as well. The Crown Estate Offshore Wind Leasing Round, called Scott Wind, is now gearing up to go ahead. Um, Forestry and Land Scotland uh, are now engaged in the initial stages of their next round of opening up parts of the National Forest Estate for wind, hydro, solar and battery storage. The Central Marine Plan for Offshore Wind is moving forward. We have the new Heat Networks Bill and very recently we've seen the increased possibility of a 600 megawatt subsea grid connection to Shetland. A large number of these projects, projects and developments could benefit the highlands and islands. Turning now to, to climate change, the, the attempts to tackle climate change were of course to be underscored by the holding of COP26 in Glasgow in November. We still wait a specific date for when that will be held, but hopefully the postponement will only be till spring of the summer of next year. That is due to be preceded by the Scottish Government's Climate Action Plan. And although that has been delayed, it's really important that that now pushes ahead, particularly after some movement from the UK Government in relation to the CFD. We've already heard of the money set aside in the Scottish budget for low carbon capital investment and fresh seed money for the new Scottish National Investment Bank, both of which should help drive the transition to net zero in accordance with our 2045 targets. 
a lot of this will to some extent be delayed by the coronavirus and at the moment there is still uncertainty over what work can proceed during the lockdown. The Scottish Government has taken a stricter position than its UK counterpart on access to sites and construction work, but some is still proceeding, including on sites which are due to generate this year and which National Grid are for terms essential, subject of course to observing safety measures. There are also concerns about whether ecological work, especially that undertaken during April-May, can continue. The governments have both given some comfort on deadlines. The Scottish Government has provided extensions for planning consents that were due to expire by, 20, 20, sorry, by September 2020, extending up to April 2021. And the UK Government has indicated allowances will be given if CFD milestones cannot be achieved because of the lockdown and also provided six months extensions for certain feed-in tariff projects. The Land Register of Scotland has also had to consider digital adjustments to allow acquisitions and sales and new leases to complete. This is very much a moving picture and no doubt there will be further developments and announcements because, more than ever, we are clearly living in uncertain times. I appreciate there will also be concern that government and private capital money, which might otherwise have been available to support renewable energy projects, may be much tighter because of the effect the virus has had and will continue to have on our economy. And it may well be that we come out of this crisis with different ways of life and different priorities. But I very much hope that replacing fossil fuels with renewable energy and reducing our emissions will play a central role in all of that. Thank you for listening and enjoy the rest of the talks. Thanks for joining us for this virtual Shrek 2020 session. We should all have been in the Kings Mills Hotel today for the conference and awards, but for obvious reasons that's been postponed until the 24th of September. Put the date in your diary and we really hope that we'll see you then. I'm Nikki Marr. For the next 15 or so minutes I'll be chatting to George Baxter, Director of Development at Green Power International, about climate change and how the planning regime can help. George, thank you very much for joining us. How is lockdown treating you? Um, it's well, I think like everybody else, we're we're all uh, in, a, in a kind of state of um, a little bit of frustration, um, difficulty in going about normal daily life, um, uh, not being able to see family. Uh, you know, there's um, I think it's kind of shared sense of anxiety and frustration across everybody but nevertheless you know I, I'm one of the lucky ones in that I I can work from home quite a lot yeah. and you know a lot of people either can't do that or their places of work have um, you know made them redundant or I you know there's all the people who have to go out to work and people working in emergency and care services you know it's um, and we all share uh, you know, mutual respect and uh, uh, just all at their, um, you know, at their courage and their commitment to helping. Absolutely. I mean, respect and gratitude are two words that are, are used a lot these days, but I, I don't think they, we could use them too lightly. You've not been with Green Power International very long, but you do have a long history of working in renewables, particularly in the Highlands and Islands. Tell us a little bit how you got to where you are now. Uh, well, I, I've yeah, I have worked. I worked at SSE. Uh, it's a renewable development company for the last 10, 12 years, and uh, yeah, developed a lot of schemes in the Highlands. I know the uh, the Highlands very well. Um, I'm sorry not to be at the Kings Mills today as well, because it's an annually a really good event to catch up with uh, with colleagues and with stakeholders and to have a good discussion. Um, but yeah, I've worked in the fields uh, for for quite some time and uh, quite familiar with 
a lot of the issues faced by Highland people and communities. Um, I started at Green Power just six months or so ago uh, as their director of development and uh, looking to develop more renewable energy schemes. It's a small, independent uh, Scottish company and uh, with uh, lofty ambitions. Oh, well, I like that. We, it's good to, good to have ambitions. Now, had we been at the King's Mills uh, today, then you would have been talking about the Scottish government's planning regime and how that is going to be instrumental or will be instrumental in helping with climate change. Right now, we're in the middle of this global COVID pandemic, but the climate change crisis is very much still there. Yeah, absolutely. I don't think the whilst the COVID issue is uppermost in all of our minds, uh, I don't think that diminishes the importance nor the urgency with which we need to also tackle the climate emergency. It may not be, uh, you know, it might not feel immediate, but it really is. And for uh, on a global level, uh, it's typically affects the most vulnerable. Um, there's you know, huge disruption to supply chains, to food production systems, extreme weather events are having massive uh, impacts on, on people all over the world. Um, so whilst in Scotland we may feel slightly less affected by that um, compared to some other more vulnerable countries, uh, you know, it's coming at us at uh, an incredible rate and we really need to act with the same kind of urgency and collective responsibility that we are seeing across the world on uh, the coronavirus. Uh, and, and in some ways it's a kind of lesson for us. You know, we can do this, we can act yeah. and things can change rapidly and they really need to. And we can, as, as, as we are all just showing, we can work from home. So a lot of the journeys, for example, that we make on a day-to-day -day basis and think are essential, um, well, clearly they're yeah. not, we have... Yeah, I think we need to really think about the way that we live and change the way that we live. But that also applies to the kind of infrastructure that we have. So, for example, the, the number of electric cars at the moment is tiny. Um, you know, there's no reason why within a decade we can not all be traveling in electrically powered vehicles and buses and trains. You've got one yourself, haven't you? I have an electric car, yeah, I, I, uh, a relatively inexpensive second-hand little Nissan Leaf. Um, it's the best purchase I've ever made in my life. It was cheaper, it's actually cheaper to run and it was cheaper to lease than the, um, than the kind of estate car that I used to fossil fuel powered estate car I used to have. So I think, um, it, it, you know, things can change. That's the, the, the key message, I think, and they can change quickly. Uh, we've seen, uh, uh, you know, quite a significant development of renewable energy over the last 10, 15 years in Scotland. We're now at, uh, you know, nearly, you know, 90% heading for 100% of our electricity, current electricity use coming from renewables. So, um, but we need to go a lot lot further we need to really eat into transport we need to be heating our homes and our uh, powering our industries much much more uh, in fact completely from renewable energy sources and renewable electricity has a large part to play in that the reason i was going to talk about planning is that the planning system really is the key to doing that and um, has a huge role to play and uh, you know, that, in, that's, in, uh, in what ways? In what ways can, can planning well, help then? What? Well, planning can help by uh, the different um, approaches that local authorities take, for example, and the, the kind of planning policy around infrastructure. So, uh, you know, for just for example, um, the planning system could uh, say that there will be no new permissions at all for any new petrol stations. Okay. You know, it could do that. The planning system can determine the level of insulation that's required for people's houses. Planning system can give much more weight towards the development of, um, of renewable energy schemes. And at the moment we are 
acting and making decisions based on policy that was agreed in 2014 when targets were much lower, when the challenge seemed much less, um, and we really need to up our game in light of the climate emergency that's been declared. So that kind of policy environment around where how decisions are reached on schemes is really, really important. And one of the things that I think is, uh, is really important right now is that Scotland is reviewing its whole planning regime. A new national planning framework is going to come in. It should have been getting consulted on by now. There is a bit of an early consultation period coming on uh, that's ongoing right now, but um, they would expect the government to publish a draft later this year uh, to be enacted next year. And that will determine the whole policy environment for planning and decision making for the next 10 years. So it's absolutely critical that we get that right and that that is really positive towards renewable energy generation. So one of the things that uh, always comes up when we're looking at renewables and where wind farms, for example, should be sited is should they be within 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 sort of where we can see them should they be on peatlands should they be in in you know, mountainous areas barren areas and, and that is a that is a big consideration isn't it and there are different competing interests that all seem to come together and implode uh, and how is that to be resolved well yeah i mean this is the thing um the planning system tends to be quite adversarial um and and it is important that people's opinions are taken into account but I think it needs to be a bit more pragmatic. I mean, we've had 10, 15 years of wind farm development in the Highlands, for example. The sky has not fallen in. People are used to them. It's, you know, regular polls tell you 79% of people, for example, quite like them. But we tend to give a lot of oxygen or a lot of oxygen seems to be given to um, particular interests or uh, those who, who just say things very loudly with extreme language. And so, uh, and newspapers love that kind of stuff. So wind farms are seen as controversial. You know, I don't think they actually really are for most people. I think if you talk to most young people, they'll just say, they, they just look at you quizzically, wondering how somebody could actually not like them. Um, so I think we need to get the landscape issue right. And that is a big challenge for the new planning policy regime. You know, on some of the more detailed issues, for example, in wild land, mm -hmm. you know, one person from one person's wild land, say they're coming up from the central belt for a little visit somewhere in the highlands, and they'll see a barren landscape and they'll think, well, this feels really wild. An ecologist might look at that landscape and say this is an absolutely degraded, denuded, really human influenced, damaged environment that is not really um, very alive with a, an ecosystem that works. The peatland on it is really damaged and is leaching uh, carbon. Um, whilst a local person in the highlands might look back into their ancestral past and say, well, you know, that people used to live there yeah. these used to be living landscapes this is these landscape used to support our communities now they're 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 removed from us um so i think the the the, the balance uh, needs to be a little bit better you know another part of government policy which is strongly supported in the highlands is to repopulate okay. rural areas and to retain young people with jobs um, and to create a thriving living economy in remoter areas of the country. The renewable energy is the absolute key to doing that. So there needs to be a more balanced approach and I think we need to see landscape impact in a, in a, in a more pragmatic way. We are in a climate emergency, uh, so we do have to push the boundaries on what we need to produce. To just go back to something touched on earlier, you know, we're, we've done really well, we're nearly at 100% renewable electricity, but that's really just the start of the journey. Um, we wouldn't want anyone to think that we were, you know, near job done. It's important to recognise that electricity consumption at the moment only represents about 20% of our emissions. 
um, and that we really need to start decarbonizing the heating in homes and the powering industry and the transport fuels. So, uh, you know, we're, we've kind of done pretty well. We're 20% of the way there, not 100% of the way, way there. Uh, a lot of those other sectors will be decarbonized by renewable electricity. Um, the Climate Change Committee that advises Scottish government and UK government has said that we need to quadruple the amount of renewable electricity um, and uh, renewable energy developments. So we've done pretty well, but there's a long, long way to go. So lots of opportunities then, if we are going to quadruple what we're, we're doing in, in that field uh, with jobs, as you've touched it upon, but there are other benefits for local communities, for example, from, from having a local wind farm. Yeah, I mean, if you look at the Great Glen, for example, you know, a huge amount of uh, extra uh, development um, there over the last 10 years, but also a huge amount of funds being uh, poured into those communities, which have done amazing things. You know, the 360 cycle track around the uh, around, around Loch Ness, Ness. Yeah. a lot of that has been came out about from the Stone Lair wind farm development. Um, the, uh, you know, the, the community benefit payments in the area are, I think, exceed over £2 million a year. And some of that has been used, for example, to rebuild the, um, the doctor surgery in Fort Augustus, which is an amazing community endeavour, an amazing community effort. And um, the, an SSE, for example, was, was delighted to be part of that effort. And of course, the benefit to the community there in having a local GP practice and a, and a, a surgery there means people are not having to travel a 60 mile round trip to, to see the nearest GP. So it's a, it's a real and tangible benefit to that community yeah, from uh, having a renewable uh, wind farm at the top of the hill. Yes, yeah, absolutely. And and we see it in small things, too. It's not just the big projects. It's, it, it's, it's small things. It's been able to help schools. It's been able to help. Uh, you know, um, with local community events, uh, there's all sorts of things, and it's but it's not just cash. I mean, the, even creating a small number of jobs in some remote communities makes a disproportionately huge mm -hmm. positive impact on that community. So, you know, half a dozen jobs in the back beyond in Sutherland has the same effect as creating a a, a major steel plant with hundreds of jobs in the central belt in terms of supporting the local schools, supporting local jobs, supporting local community, retaining young people. Renewable energy can really do all those things. Okay, so this is an emergency. It is a crisis, not the COVID one, but in that, but there is that bigger one that's been there for longer as well. How optimistic are you that, well, I suppose the Scottish government will get these new planning laws right? Um, I'm, I'm relatively optimistic. I, I think they will see the real based on the reality of development that despite all of the naysaying and the fears that were raised by a number of people and, and you know some people are quite legitimately concerned about change and uh, but they've seen a lot of change in the last 10 years. The sky has not fallen in. And in fact, I think it's high time we looked upon renewable energy as a massive opportunity rather than a, a threat. Um, I think government gets that. How it translate, translates that into planning, uh, new planning legislation it remains to be seen. The document will be published uh, later this year and hopefully it contains a lot of enabling, positive and a lot more pragmatism around delivering on the climate emergency and, uh, you know, can really help to create more sustainable communities across the Highlands. Well, let's hope um, so. Yeah, I mean, I, you know, just as a, a little throwaway comment to finish, because uh, I think we're running out of time, but, you know, when I was a 17, 18 year old whippersnapper, uh, very concerned about the environment, I had my uh, little wind power, yes, please, badges on, uh, going on demonstrations. I, um, you know, I never in a, uh, it was, it felt then like it was a bit of a pipe dream. Uh, you know, it felt like it was this relatively small number of people mm -hmm. wanting to see wind farms developed and really pretty small type 
ambitions really but you know in a relatively short period of time it's now the main industrial base of the one of the main industrial bases of the country it is the the main uh, opportunity to get out of the climate mess that we've got into and the guys the, the people and the companies uh, the engineers that create this technology it is absolutely amazing how it's developed and it will develop further yeah well like to go in your adult lifetime from effectively a pipe dream to the reality that we have just now is is incredibly optimistic and I hope uh, I hope that picture continues. George, um, I hope you can join us in September when we carry on this conversation. We might know by then a wee bit more about what the Scottish Government are up to, but uh, we shall carry on and we'll see you then. Thanks very much for your time. Thank you very much. David Bowen and the Harper McLeod team for the opportunity to talk to you today. I remain hopeful that the full conference will indeed take place later this year and that I will get the chance to meet many of you then. But meantime, I very much welcome the opportunity to support this digital offering. I'm Audrey Kiever. I'm the Director of Energy and Low Carbon at Highlands and Islands Enterprise, the Economic and Community Development Agency for this beautiful and brilliant region. I've been asked to talk about climate change and how the Highlands and Islands can contribute towards a transition to net zero. But as I am representing the region's Economic and Community Development Agency, first I must address COVID-19 and our response. At this time, it is hard to comprehend the full impact of COVID-19 and what the future holds personally, professionally and for businesses and communities across the Highlands and Islands. Indeed, I don't feel particularly comfortable speculating at this current time, given the scale of human catastrophe, but it is incumbent upon organisations such as Highlands and Islands Enterprise, responsible for supporting businesses and developing communities, to help during this immediate crisis, and also to plan ahead for the economic recovery in the new world. The UK and Scottish governments have already outlined unprecedented financial and economic measures and to complement those measures, Scotland's three enterprise agencies are working together with their partners, Skills Development Scotland, local authorities and Business Gateway, to support businesses the length and breadth of the country. We encourage organisations to visit findbusinesssupport.gov.scot website and or call the dedicated helpline 0300 303 0660. Further work to prioritise resources and gather industry intelligence to help inform future policy and support mechanisms is underway. Together we are committed to do whatever we can to support businesses and communities at this critical time. And we thank you for all you are doing to help your employees, your businesses, businesses throughout the Highlands and Islands and your communities to survive, stay resilient and adapt to what are very uncertain and challenging circumstances. Moving from one crisis to another, the climate emergency, as declared by First Minister last spring, remains a global crisis, despite any short-term reprieve suggested as a result of COVID-19. And I believe that the Highlands and Islands is very well placed to play a full and active part in ending Scotland's contribution to climate change by the Scottish Government's target date of 2045. We all have a part to play no matter where we live, by making choices that help to reduce carbon emissions, whether that be the cars that we drive, how we heat our homes, the food that we eat, how we shop, where we go on holiday, etc. But for the Highlands and Islands, there is the opportunity to become an exemplar region in the transition to a low carbon, indeed net zero economy, through the continuing development of a world-class renewable energy industry. We can achieve this by using our people, knowledge, wealth of natural resources, technology and infrastructure for the economic and social benefit of the Highlands and Islands. The transition to net zero emissions 
will require not just decarbonisation of our power, but of heat and transport too. Much of the answer lies in considerably greater deployment of renewable generation, whether that be the, to create electrons or alternative vectors such as hydrogen. Further, greater strides in resource efficiency, energy efficiency and a focus on the circular economy will be necessary. So why do I believe the region can punch well above its weight? I think there are five key factors. One is that we have a track record of innovation. We are home to a series of world firsts, including the Beatrice Deepwater Wind Demonstrator, the European Marine Energy Centre in Orkney, Wave Energy Scotland as a subsidiary of Highlands and Islands Enterprise. We also have leading technology developers in the space of tidal energy, Maygen, Nova Innovation, Orbital Marine, for example. And we have very many innovative products and services um, coming from companies such as Proterra, 4C Engineering, Pure, for example. Being surrounded by innovative people, businesses and communities creates a confidence and a desire to do more. Take a look at EMEC, for example, highly innovative in its support for wave and tidal testing has led it with a range of industry and community part partners naturally on to further innovative demonstrations in the area of energy storage, hydrogen and smart energy systems. Innovation breeds further innovation. Secondly, the ability to deliver competitively at scale. We have unique and well-placed port infrastructure to support the likes of the Beatrice Offshore Wind Farm currently Scotland's largest offshore wind farm operating, Murray East and potentially Murray West offshore wind farms. And as we gear up to support further offshore leasing through Crown Estate Scotland's up and coming Scotland leasing round and seek to deliver against the UK offshore wind sector deal and the UK government manifesto commitments of 40 gigawatts of offshore wind by 2030, the scale will be ever important ever-increasing turbine sizes and floating wind foundations will require relatively unique facilities, which we have here in the Highlands and Islands. Thirdly, we have a very well-equipped supply chain with experience and legacy from the oil and gas and nuclear industries, which has the skills and expertise as well as the leadership to drive forward the transition and energy integration, the build-out and operations of on and offshore renewables and the delivery of smart, local, low-carbon energy systems. Fourthly, I believe we have a real strong culture of collaboration here in the region. This exists between the Highlands and Islands, within the Highlands and Islands and throughout the Highlands and Islands and with international partners. Academia, industry and the public sector has consistently and effectively led on addressing particular Highlands and Islands challenges and sector-wide opportunities for the benefits of the region. A recent example is the establishment of the Deep Wind Cluster. Over 270 member organisations working together to aid the deployment of offshore wind and secure economic, economic benefits from doing so. And more long-term collaborative effort has been that of our ambition to secure island interconnectors, working with industry, local authorities and Scottish Government. So, as well as collaboration, there remains, remains fierce determination. Lastly, in terms of contributory factors, I believe that we have competent, capable communities, and these have been at the heart of the region's renewable energy success story to date. And these will be well placed to support decentralised local energy systems whilst exploring greater use of the region's natural capital, including the vast peatlands for carbon sequestration. Building on such a solid foundation, our priorities over the coming year will be to continue excellence in offshore test and demonstration, to stimulate business growth through internationalisation and innovation, to secure significant supply chain development and sector-wide growth from the large-scale projects, and to seek to find an enhanced community energy role, including in the demonstration projects in low-carbon local energy systems. But naturally, We'll continue to review these, not just through the lens of net zero, but also through the lens of COVID-19. In conclusion, 
When it comes time to reflate the economy, I suspect that clean energy and net zero will be at the heart of the UK and Scottish Government plans. This is where I believe there are grounds for cautious optimism in economic recovery for the Highlands and Islands. The natural energy resources in terms of wind, wave and tide, combined with the world-class testing facilities, academia, ports, supply chain and expertise, places this region in a strong position to play a very full and active role. This, all in the context of a new world perhaps, involving new attitudes to home working, local purchasing and travelling, will help our economy not only to survive, but to thrive. I look forward to meeting you in better times later this year and will very much welcome the opportunity to discuss in more detail how the Highlands and Islands can lead the charge on the transition to net zero. Thank you. Thanks for joining us for this virtual Shrek 2020 session. We should have all been in the Kings Mills Hotel today for the conference and awards, but for obvious reasons that's been postponed until the 24th of September. Put that date in your diary and we really hope that we'll see you then. I'm Nikki Marr and for the next half hour or so I'll be chatting to Terry Stebbings, he's co-founder of Proterra Energy and we'll be talking about his innovative business. I'm also talking to Ryan Felber from Zero Waste Scotland's Energy Efficiency Business Support Service. Now, as well as finding out about what each organisation does and can do for you and your business, we'll also be looking at how COVID-19 is impacting their work and trying to gaze into a crystal ball for thoughts about what the renewable energy market might look like once we come out of the other side of this global pandemic. Ryan Felber, Terry Stebbings, thank you both very much for joining me. Let's start with you, Terry. Tell me about your company, Proterra Energy. What is it you do and how do you do it? Where did you come from? Yep, and no worries. Proterra Energy uh, designs and builds micro hydro schemes predominantly. Um, we specialize in off grid schemes. So that's schemes that are in very remote areas where there is no electricity or no, no electrical grid. Um, in the wider sort of off-grid renewables, so that could be hydro, solar, batteries, that kind of thing. Um, we work predominantly in Scotland, um, but over the last couple of years, we started looking further afield internationally, and we've developed a, a small off-grid product called Hydro Trailer, which is a self-contained uh, hydro scheme with batteries uh, that can feed sort of 20 to 30 houses in, a, in the developing world, so Sub-Saharan Africa or Southeast Asia. Um, Same technology as a company, you're we, using? That, that's using hydro, so that's micro hydro. It's got a little hydro turbine and some batteries. It's basically like a diesel generator, but it runs on water. Fantastic. So that's we've kind of diversified over the last couple of years into, into looking at uh, international markets as well. But we started out in 2012, um, really looking at micro hydro, so small scale hydro schemes for crofts, farms, estates, um, and really have built since then. Now, feed-in tariffs, as I understand, were a really big incentive for a lot of your clients when you started out because the, it was a fairly generous offering from the government. Um, they've gone now. So why is it that people are still using your products? Is it carbon footprint or what, what's their incentive? Yeah, that's absolutely right. And the feed-in tariffs are now, are now ended. There's still a little tail of those schemes that had permissions from a couple of years ago getting built. But... What we've seen as a result of that is, a, is quite a significant drop off in the number of schemes that are getting built. Um, as I mentioned, we do a lot of off grid work. So the incentivization for a client in an off grid scenario is very different. It's not solely about feed in tariffs, it's about access to energy, reliable energy. Um, and so, in some senses, we've been slightly protected from that drop off. Although, when you look at uh, the split of our work nowadays, it is significantly less. Of the design and build side because there there really aren't as many schemes going ahead i mean probably 10 percent as a rough guess so the the tariff the end of the tariff has been significant for us 
it is still viable and possible to build hydro schemes or micro hydro schemes in the current market, but the use has to be really about self-consumption or off the offset of self-consumption. So if you can use that energy locally and therefore not have to purchase electricity from the grid, then you can make it stack up. Okay, and what sort of, I mean, obviously you can't uh, talk for every one of your clients, but what sort of um, lifeline is there in these products? I mean, how quickly can they be, they be paid off? The, the, life, the lifetime of, of a hydro scheme should be 30, 40 years, if, if, if well designed and built. Um, in terms of payoff, <laughs> I think that's part of the challenge is to try and readdress how people look at it. So the feed and tariff scheme was great it, it, for all renewables in a sense that it was a sort of an an injection of adrenaline that, that moved it, you know, moved them forward. However, that's kind of gone. And so people need to maybe think of it in a different way rather than a, a, a diversified form of income and a, and a pretty good one in the early days at that. People need to think of it now as more of a long term investment for exactly that offsetting their, their energy costs um rather like you look at you don't buy an oil boiler and wonder how quick it's going to pay you back or a gas boiler you buy it because you have to because you need heating in your house yeah and maybe that's the way people need to think about it and so the returns if you want to think of it like that come from the offset of purchasing your electricity um and the time it takes to pay back and the fact that it still does pay back makes can make it an attractive option but we People need to think for our clients. We have to help our clients think of it in a different way. So how should they be thinking of it then? More in, in those terms and more in more terms, in terms of, of offset. So more in terms yeah. of, of that. It's not a cash. It's not a it's not a, a quick win cash injection. It's something that they potentially invest in to over the long term um, from a point of view of offsetting their energy costs. And there is there are the non tangible benefits from a financial perspective of being able to talk about using green energy, depending on why they're doing it. For example, if they ran letting cottages, in something common in the Highlands, or a farm that produced a certain product, they could say, well, any energy that's been used in you know, producing this product has come from renewables, which you know, in today's environment is, is important. And that can be very attractive uh, for attracting new business. Um, Ryan, you're doing a lot of nodding there on behalf of uh, energy efficiency business support. Tell us a little bit about what it is that you do, because you've recently had a name change, so folk might not be familiar with the uh, the logo that's behind you just now. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah, um, I mean, we were known as Resource Efficient Scotland, um, so it's just a little bit of rebranding. We're still supported through Zero Waste Scotland and, and funded by Scottish Government. Um, I mean, our remit as a program is very much about uh, helping businesses identify opportunities to reduce the, the carbon emissions. Um, and, and the reality at the same time as looking at that, there's savings to be made um, on that. Um, absolutely, I was nodding along, you know, feed-in tariff uh, was a very good um, incentive. Uh, and I totally agree with what Terry's saying. It's very much whether you look at micro hydro or, or solo PV, um, if a business was to put a solar PV system in, maybe generates 30% of their electricity, well, that's 30% that they know that they're getting for free at the moment. So if energy prices go up, which is very likely that they will do, or they, they tend to, to go up rather than down, um, that, that kind of future proofs it a little bit and says actually there's 30%. And, and that's where they're making the savings is by using that electricity um, on site. Okay, so how do you help businesses then? You you, you predominantly help SMEs and uh, to become presumably, as the name suggests, more energy efficient in their business. Uh, but it's it's almost like a, a two phase process, isn't it? Yeah, absolutely. I mean, it, it's very much um, about uh, putting together a report for the businesses to help them identify what these opportunities are, um, and and you know that can look at anything from uh, the lighting, looking at heating system, insulation, things like that. Really, anything um, that. that it's, it's costing the business money uh, in terms of energy usage. Um, obviously, renewables come into play there, um, and there's a great opportunity to put renewable technologies and rather than just upgrading an oil boiler to a new oil boiler, which again might, might be energy efficient, there's the opportunity to look beyond that and actually have something that's a little bit more sustainable. Uh, in, in the long run. So that's, uh, yeah, that's a kind of free report that we do for businesses to quantify these opportunities for them. 
Okay, so in normal terms then, people, businesses would approach you, what, through the website or what, or by phone? Yeah, absolutely. Yeah, yeah. So through through our website, we've got a, a hub based in Glasgow, so they can make the inquiries there. And um, what we've got, we've got uh, implementation advisors such as myself uh, across uh, the whole of Scotland. So I'm based in Inverness. So I tend to cover kind of highlands and islands. Um, again, just with the local knowledge and, and as Terry's mentioned we've got off-grid properties up here which they really don't have as much as in the central belt and things like that um, and uh, yeah so we work on kind of very closely with the businesses talk them through trying to work through them to identify what these opportunities might be and um, uh, uh, with the idea to put a report together to to quantify them for them. And you would normally go out uh, very often I imagine and, business, and visit the business in, in, in person yeah, absolutely. So um, again, we, we, we have done reports uh, as telephone audits in the past. It's always been there for, for, for various reasons. Um, but absolutely, yeah, On uh, if the situation was normal, we'd be looking to head out to the businesses. Um, it just helps us engage with them. It helps us identify maybe opportunities that we might miss if we don't see them. Um, and often when we're doing the site visits, we might actually pick up on opportunities um, that don't cost anything. Um, and, you know, it might be as silly as saying, well, why is that piece of equipment on? Or why is the lighting in that room on? Oh, it gets switched on first thing in the morning and not till the evening. Uh, uh, things like that. So there's sometimes some no cost opportunities that we can pick up on and, uh, because... and advise on them. And they just didn't realize it was costing them so much. Yeah, and, and reducing the, you know, your, your energy usage is, is the first step. And then, of course, trying to get more efficient ways of, of getting energy into the building, into the business uh, and using less of it is, is the second part. Absolutely. Yeah, yeah, I mean, if we're talking about electricity generation, whichever technology it is, um, absolutely, we would first recommend to reduce your consumption wherever possible in the first place. Um, and it just means that, A, the system might not need to be as big, or you can benefit from it a lot more. It's going to be a high percentage of your uh, en uh, electricity usage. Um, so normally the payback... <coughs> Um, for uh, um, energy efficiencies, uh, so whether it be changing the lighting or something like that, tends to be a lot quicker than renewables. Uh, renewables tend to be a little bit more of an investment. Uh, so absolutely, in the order of to do things, it kind of makes sense to maybe do that. And that would actually free up some money to then be able to invest in slightly longer term projects. You mentioned the word invest there. You, you can help with that because you do offer uh, interest-free loans for your well, some of the things that you're offering, some of the things yeah, that you're suggesting. Yeah, absolutely. So um, businesses, sort of... do, yeah, sorry, businesses do need to get uh, one of our reports, but one of the key things that we're looking to identify in the report is um, you know, whatever the opportunity may be, be it, for example, uh, by solar PV, that's a great example. And uh, what we're going to try and give the business an idea is what, how much of an investment that's likely to be based on the size of the system that we, we recommend. <laughs> what they're looking to, to save financially. So that's offsetting the uh, electricity cost that they're having to buy in. And that gives us a, a payback period. It also gives us uh, the calculations for, for identifying what the carbon reductions are going to be. And all that information is very, uh, gives them access to uh, an SME loan. Um, so it's an interest-free SME loan. It's paid back over an eight-year period. And it's anything between £1,000 up to £100,000. So it's very much there to, to deal with may maybe larger, more costly projects too. And how? what sort of lead-in time is there if a business comes to you asking for the report uh, and you make a recommendation perhaps to go for one of uh, Terry's micro-hydro systems, for example, and how quickly could that all be before they, they've got that in process? Yeah, I mean, the, the process of putting a report together uh, is relatively quick. Um, I mean, we do an initial scoping call where we try and uh, hash out what the opportunities are, what, which ones should be included in the report. Um, normally, four or six weeks after that, they, they could be looking to be sitting there with that report. Um, okay. It really depends on how many opportunities we're looking at and how complex they are. Uh, when we're looking at something uh, like a micro-hydro micro scheme, there's a lot more um, data to be gathered. There's a lot more um, um, analysis to be made. And we have worked with Terry in the past and used the information that he's gathered over a much longer period of time to, to help us inform our reports. Terry, how are Proterra coping during lockdown? Are you, I mean, you're in the business of providing energy. Are you key workers or what, what's happening there? Well, um, I guess there's a, there's a three pronged answer to that question. Um, we've got, we are currently still operating, but with a very reduced staff. And we've had to put over 50% of our staff on furlough 
Okay. And that's really because of three different parts to it. There's we've got to consider our staff themselves and what their thoughts and concerns are in, in terms of the work that we're doing. We also have to look at our clients and our clients, a number of our clients are saying to us, look, we're concerned about you coming out to sites and working on sites because of how that might cause spread of the virus, et cetera. And then the third part to that is really what uh, advice and direction we get from the government as to whether we are considered key workers. And um, understandably, that's quite a complex thing. It's very hard with all the different types of industries and number of companies there are in the UK to decide definitively who's a key worker. Of course. So we've tried to kind of navigate that path as best we can. Um, key is to think of how our workers are feeling and, and those because we're quite site based, uh, we can't really work from home as such. Um, although some of our support team, uh, the sort of administrative side, were working from home. And so we've taken that as really our first starting point. Um, like I said, we've got a number of clients who have sort of expressed to us that the projects we're working on, they'd like to defer. And that has had an impact, which means that our revenues have effectively fallen probably 60 to 70%. Mm -hmm. um, We've tried to get a little bit of advice around whether we're key workers or, or essential work, if you like. And, and what we've tried to do is, is to look at our projects as a whole and identify those uh, jobs or projects that are essential. So, for example, our off-grid customers, their energy is essential to them. They have no other option. They can't flick onto the grid, as it were. And systems that where we're doing servicing and maintenance, where if we don't carry out that maintenance, there's a potential risk to the client's assets. Then, then we were looking to do that. And we have a, in place a set of procedures, enhanced procedures for our own sort of safety and welfare and that of our clients. And, and we're following those procedures. So pretty much significant reduction in, in the work that we're doing. We have a skeleton staff, i.e. me and, uh, and a couple others, two others, another engineer and another senior engineer who are, who are still working. And we're just trying to, to sort of carry ourselves through. We've tried to be a bit of a prudent company in the, back, in the past, so we're not kind of, about to drop off a cliff edge in okay. terms of revenues or sorry, cash basis, which is quite important for companies, especially small companies. Um, and we're just trying to sort of work our way through. Okay, well, I hope you're I hope you're still here when you know we come out on the other side. But it certainly it seems that from what you you've told me and from what I understand, a lot of what you're doing is putting in systems that add resilience, especially to companies that are are, are working off grid. Um, and you'd hope that that would then help you be more resilient uh, coming, uh, coming out the other side. Yeah, I, I think from, you know, just from a, a sort of business perspective, given, you know, which is a probably fifth or sixth level of importance in the current crisis. But, you know, from a business perspective, um, yes, the fact that we work with off-grid is very similar to the feed-in tariffs ending. It's given us a sense of an element of resilience in terms of our business and, yeah. and therefore that. But. Yeah, I think what we've got to ensure is that we're providing the service that our customers require. You know, it's like I say, it's back to those three, those three elements. Are our people safe? Are we, are we keeping our clients safe and providing the service for those that need it? And are we following the government's advice? So that's Sounds as doing. though you're doing exactly, exactly the right thing, uh, Terry. Ryan, how are, are you finding things changing from, from your point of view? You're working from home. Um, it looks as though you're in a, a very fancy office just now, but that's a, well, <laughs> should, we, should, we, should we give away your secret Microsoft Teams? And that's a, a backdrop that you've put up. Um, but you are working from home. You've got your wife at home. You've got three children downstairs. How are you finding uh, working from home? And what is the, how has your work changed? Yeah, um, I mean, I'm very fortunate that I'm able to to continue work from home and we're able to continue the service that we do. Um, I mean, absolutely, there, there was definitely a drop off in interest uh, from businesses. There was a clear focus that they needed to to. Um, understand the crisis, uh, prioritise what they need to do um, in, in terms of keeping the business uh, afloat uh, and um, any funding they're able to get and, and things like that. Um, so from that perspective, there's a couple of things, um, you know, I had lined up conversations with businesses, obviously they've been pushed back. Um, what we've tried to do as a programme to respond, we're very conscious not every single business is in the same position. So some businesses actually now they've put loan applications in uh, and things like that for, for government funding. They're actually sitting there with uh, 
a little bit more time on their hands than they've had in the past. Yeah. Uh, so actually that's opened up an opportunity uh, to, to have conversations and actually look at things like the energy usage, which has not necessarily been a priority for them. They, they, they had to, the day-to-day -day running of the business always comes first. Yeah. Um, so that's kind of opened that. And I've got really good examples. Somebody, you know, we've been kind of, off and on for two or three months now, not, not finding the right time to talk and things like that. And, and now it's like, yeah, great, I've got time, Ryan. Um, so we're very much kind of leaving it to, to businesses to, to tell us actually, is this a good time to continue and, and have conversations and things like that. And what we've put together is a, what we call virtual um, assessment, energy assessment. Um, so we can look at uh, energy usage, energy bills and things like that. So we've tried to do, um, you know, continue our service and we can, we can continue to do reports. We can do them um, over the phone as telephone based audits. Okay. There might be some elements that we can't do, uh, then obviously we can pick up at a later point. But that will help you hit the ground running, I guess, once we come out of the other side. So clients and businesses who have been quieter and do have that time, as you say, to sort of think, well, what could we do? Can we see if we can get our energy, uh, if, if it, our, our company to be more energy efficient? Uh, yeah. If they've got the time to do that, then now is a good time. And uh, when we come out of the other side, they may then be in a position to apply for a loan or consider making changes yeah absolutely and, and again i think um you know there's no cost to our report it is there to to provide the businesses with the, the, the information so they can make a decision and um, there's obviously no obligation to install anything that we recommend so it's about having that information so they can make the best decision for what they need to do moving forward whether that happens um you know as soon as the the, the lockdown is over and they, they want to crack on with something or whether they just want to get the business back up and running get a bit more stability and they're looking to do something early next year absolutely fine you know but i think having that information so they know what the opportunities are where they can make savings um, and again you know if they're able to make savings on an energy side um you know that's funds they can use for something else OK, we talked a little bit earlier about the drivers to using renewable energy as opposed to fossil based energy, fossil fuels. Um, Ryan, what are you seeing from people who are coming to you uh, and asking for the, the audit and then perhaps some funding? What are you seeing as their drivers to, to becoming more energy efficient or to uh, using renewable energy? Yeah, um, I mean, th th there's been a, a, a big shift, particularly over the last kind of year, maybe year and a half. Um, I mean, I was just going to use the example that the Oxford word of the year last year in 2019 was climate emergency. Mm -hmm. um, and this is really based on, on, on it being a hot topic. This is what people are talking about. Uh, and again, uh, before uh, COVID-19, it, it was on the news every single day. You know, it, it was on uh, on that. So people are a lot more aware of it. They're a lot more aware that they have to do something about it. Uh, and therefore, when they are actually making inquiries um, to us, uh, it used to be very much, oh, we'd like to save money. Whereas now there's been a little bit more focus saying, well, actually, I want to make my best business or reduce my carbon emissions for my business. What can I do? Um, and as we kind of talked before, and the two come really hand in hand. So you don't have to choose one over the other. Um, but in terms of renewables, because they are slightly larger investment, but a lot more business are still keen to look at them, whereas beforehand they go, oh, I just need a quick fix. They understand actually the, the, the bigger picture, the longer um, objective uh, for the whole country. OK, and actually it, it's sort of a win, 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 isn't it? Because if you're managing to reduce your, your financial outgoings and you're increasing, you're dropping your carbon footprint and you can do it all with an interest free loan, then it would seem for many businesses to be a no brainer. And if they've got time just now to look into that, then why not? Yeah, absolutely. And and again, you, you know, it, it's um, it is an investment. I mean, th there are some opportunities that we identify that are no cost. The reality, most things will cost some money to put in, whether it's new lighting, insulation, heating systems, or, or renewables. Um, but actually, it's saying, well, how quickly will that be paid back? And absolutely, if it can be paid back in a shorter time than the eight year of the loan, then, then you, you quid's in. It's a really good investment, and that puts the business in a very good, strong position um, once they've made the loan repayments that their energy costs are as low as they possibly can be and what are the what are, the, are there any barriers to getting the loan i mean how easy is it to get the loan and to actually get the money in your pocket um so i mean it, it, it's an unsecured loan so the businesses do not have to put any um, assets uh, up against the loan and um, generally they have to have been trading at least a, a year uh, because obviously there there is a credit check that is run on the business uh, in order um, 
just make sure it's obviously public funds. We Due want diligence. to make sure that businesses are in position to pay that back uh, on there. And, I mean, it's not as robust as maybe uh, getting a loan from the bank and things like that. Um, but, but again, it, it's, it's that balance of well, how much are they asking for? Because as I said, it's anything between a thousand pounds and a hundred thousand pounds. So, um, you know, depending on the amount they're, they're asking, um, obviously there's high risk with that high monthly repayments and things like that. Um, but they can go through, you know, get get our report to identify the opportunities, apply for the loan, um, and again, still make that call at that point, whether they, they're happy with what the monthly repayments are going to look like um, and whether they still want to go ahead with it. Terry, have you anything that you'd like to add at this point on that? Have you experienced yeah, that system? I, I I think it's I think it's a great opportunity for businesses, um, especially sort of rural businesses in the Highlands, that there is something like that. And I, I would encourage um, these kind of initiatives because it's as we discussed earlier that there's kind of got to be a kind of change in mindset for folk from a, a sort of feed and tariff based idea of putting that's why I'm going to invest in my renewables to the the environmental aspect and, and the raised awareness of Ryan says that in the last year with the sort of climate emergency side of things, but for many people, it's still a financial decision, especially a business. You know, there's yeah. not, I don't think there's many businesses in the world that can make decisions that with and ignore the financial impact of them. Um, yeah. So I think initiatives like the, what, what, what Ryan's just described are important, especially while we transition from something of round about fit based approach to looking at renewables because we have to look at renewables mm -hmm. because the option is not acceptable and you know i appreciate that there are people in the world who's that and that is the view already but but businesses still need to look at them and and, and majority of our clients are looking at it from a business perspective yeah uh, but as just well because as the environmental side. as well as the environmental impact because just because we're in the middle right now as we're recording this of a of a, a covid emergency doesn't mean that the climate emergency has has gone away i mean yep. it may well be that the, the the world is is healing a little because we're not all in our planes mm -hmm. and our cars and we're we are staying at home we're not getting about we're not making those journeys we're not going on holiday uh, and our, our our we are treading more lightly on the planet because something else has forced us to do it but the emergency is still very real mm -hmm. yeah yes yeah. yeah i would say so okay. absolutely yeah can I ask us um, just now, we've, we've looked at the present situation, the uncertainty, the where we are now and the opportunities that are available. But also, can I ask you to look into your crystal balls and um, perhaps predict what you think the role of renewable energy might be at the end of this COVID crisis? Ryan, you first. Do you think it will yeah, have an I mean, impact? I mean, I think you've, you've touched upon it. I, I think, you know, the climate emergency hasn't gone away. Um, there's obviously been some great advantages uh, that have come through in terms of reduction of travel and things like that, uh, which I, I hope will continue. Um, re renewables, I, I think, you know, pe uh, businesses will look back at how they've gone through, where, where the, maybe some of the expenses have gone. Um, and it's quite possible a lot of businesses have still got high energy costs and they're, they're kind of maybe wondering why that is. Prices are going to go up. Um, so, yeah, I, I, I don't think it, it's, uh, it, I've not seen it change anything at this point and i think it might be more positive than the negative um moving forward terry do you agree with that it might be more positive than negative oh yes i i think it's, it's quite sort of difficult to you know we're floating along in a not semi-artificial world in terms of what's going on outdoors you know for many people but um renewables aren't necessarily a quick and they shouldn't be a quick decision um for people to make and i don't think people are going to you know when the lockdown finishes people are going to walk out their doors and go right i must get those solar panels or i must put that hydro scheme in or that we wind turbine up or whatever it is i i you know i i think we will i think from my perspective i i don't anticipate a significant change in um the sort of re revenue or people coming to us asking about renewables as a result i mean we have you know we have a, a Maybe you know people staying at home or working in different ways is going to be impacting in some ways. But I mean, we have a customer that's just contacted us in the last week from Scotland, from the west coast, who is an off-grid person, who has identified our hydro trailer as an opportunity because they're now they are literally having to stay at home. You know, he 
the, the, the father worked away. The, the children were typically at, at college and school. Now they're all at home. They're putting a lot more stress on their existing, uh, they've got a little generator system. And they've asked us that as a result of that, and they, they envisage being there for the next four months and possibly afterwards, could they get a hydro trailer and, and, and fit it onto a little stream beside their house to power their house? And that's an indication of a, of a, of a change, but perhaps, um, I'm not sure, it would be very difficult to say how you know, significant that impact would be in our business or businesses like us. Well, we shall we shall see. Uh, maybe by September, uh, when the we are due to do this again in person in the Kings Mills Hotel, twenty fourth, get it in your diaries. Maybe you'll both be free and you'll join us for that conversation, and we can we can look Sorry. back at when we were all locked down and how different things were, and say, my goodness, and look at the way the world has changed. Uh, Ryan, Terry, thank you very much for your time. Thanks very much for joining us. Take care. Thank you very much. Good afternoon, ladies and gentlemen, and all those able to watch this. My name is Jeremy Sainsbury from Natural Power Consultants, um, a regular attender at Shrek. And um, firstly, I hope that you are all well and all that you love are well. I'm appearing to you this time instead of from the lovely normal surroundings of the Shrek um, venues um, from a lounge somewhere in Scotland. So uh, let's hope this goes OK for you all. Um, I think Shrek is a good forum to remind everyone that despite Covid and Brexit impacts on our way of life and economy, changing many things we have assumed as normal, there are fundamentals that will remain unchanged and help to um, create the highland economy and environment of the future. I was pleased to be asked by David and Anne to give an update on the larger policy picture, uh, the framework or the blueprint for the clean energy future. So let's remind ourselves what has changed and what has happened since the last Shrek and what is likely to happen before the next one can be scheduled. So from last time we have had uh, quite a lot of activity in terms of legislation. There's the Climate Change Act for Scotland, requiring a net zero target by 2045. And there is the UK net zero by 2050. Both of those require substantial upgrading uh, of, or should I say, increases to the ambition to deliver um, renewable energy. Since then also Boris Johnson has become elected with a majority in the Commons and we have gone to Brexit stage one or completed Brexit stage one. Before the next Shrek, however, um, we are likely to have a Scottish general election somewhere in May next year, or just before May. Uh, COP26 is still on the cards, uh, so that should be good for environmental um, uh, focus in Scotland. Brexit stage two, whatever that ends up to be, whether it's hard, soft, or still in negotiation. And then the Climate Change Committee uh, will produce its sixth carbon budget. Now that is going to be reflecting the targets that are required to reach those 2045 and 2050 targets. Uh, by um, and uh, those are that's going to therefore be a much harder and uh, robust set of figures for delivery of renewables in the UK. And as a part of that, the government have recently declared that the contract for difference will happen next year, a round four, and that will include onshore wind and PV. So despite all the issues um, with the world today, we continue to develop to drive the new clean energy economy. So that's a, a, a good positive. So how might this develop in the post-COVID and Brexit world? So, here's some thoughts. See, it seems to me um, that there's a consensus that the uh, mountain of debt the country is accumulating and the global recession that has been triggered by the COVID pandemic will change the way we live and do business for a long time to come, if we ever return to what was deemed normal before. 
Austerity alone cannot address the way the country responds and bounces back. We have too large a black hole in our economy just to rely on austerity. The government is much more likely to play a role in core infrastructure going forward and convert some of the loans made to large business into equity, similar to the way um, bank shares were purchased uh, as a result of bailing out the banks in 2008. That bailout, however, has done a good thing for us just now because our banks and their balance sheets are stronger than ever and the uh, Bank of England had a very attractive um, uh, emergency fund which it could deploy to the Covid and Brexit um, ideas. So effectively, we are in a very good position to invest our way out of this process as and when we get clear to do so. It is clear that renewable energy and the, and the infrastructure that supports it is going to be one of the new clean economy high um, high priorities and it's going to be a least regrets investment for the government in the UK and in Scotland. So what about Scotland? What are Scotland's aspirations? We've, uh, we've got the uh, up-and-coming Crown Estate leasing round with, with an with a, um, objective of allowing 8 gigawatts of new offshore capacity floating and fixed bottom by 2030 and a further 20 to 30 gigawatts by 2045 if floating proves itself. Much of this will be connected through the North Sea into the north of Scotland and through the islands through the north of Scotland to the markets. So a fantastic opportunity there. But it's not just about large scale, what about small scale? Um, a just transition for communities to benefit from new uh, renewable investments is absolutely required. Air source heat pumps, electric vehicles and energy efficiency all driving a clean way to um, uh, for us to live our lives and to consume energy. Now it is time, if there ever was time, to create that plan and create that infrastructure because that is the key to our future, um, both rural and uh, national. Onshore wind and PV are going to be able to bid, as I said, into the fourth round of the contract for difference and that will bring additional investment to the Highlands, which is good news. All of these opportunities are there for the taking. The Scottish Government is currently keen for input, both local and national, to help it plan the future energy solution for both Scotland and the UK. It's really, really important that the Highlands play a major role in the development of this new plan and the implementation of that infrastructure investment to unlock the potential for the Highlands of Scotland in the investment to come. The Highland economy can not just bounce back, but it can grow and thrive in a new clean economy. Let's work on that together and make that happen. It's certainly something I look forward to working with you all on in the future and delivering for our Scottish economy. So thank you very much all for listening and stay safe. Uh, look forward to seeing you all in person hopefully next year at another Shrek or at some other event. And all of us at Natural Power wish you all the best for the, for the coming few months. Thank you and bye.